So, raise your hand if you have a pet. Keep your hand up if you let the pet sleep on your bed. How many of you bought a Christmas present for your pet? Ah, most of you. How many actually wrapped the present? <laughs> if you laughed at the people who raised their hand, or if you raised your hand, you are interested in anthrozoology. Anth means human, zo means animal, and anthrozoology is the scientific and scholarly study of human-animal interactions. We are not the same as zoology, animal science, wildlife biology, and veterinary medicine, because those traditional disciplines care about the animals. We care about the animals and the humans and their interactions. So we depend on three already existing scholarly disciplines to do anthrozoology. That is the biological sciences, the psychological sciences, and the social sciences. So all of them together help create anthrozoology where we care about both ends of the leash, both ends of the lead rope, <laughs> and both ends of the binoculars. So, from a biological perspective, we care about this young man and his hedgehog, what's going on in their bodies resulting from their interactions and relationships. From a psychological perspective, we care about the thoughts and emotions of both the human and the animal. Now, scientists have historically been ridiculed for talking about emotions and minds and animals. In fact, they call it anthropomorphism, meaning we're projecting human emotions and thoughts onto non-human animals. But today, with modern neuroscience techniques and ingenious experimental designs, we are learning all about what animals are thinking and feeling. Our cultures, our communities, and our religions contribute to how we treat animals. For example, here in Montana, we raise a lot of cattle and eat a lot of meat. But in India, the cow is sacred and the cows run freely. So how we treat animals and how we feel about them in our laws is also a part of anthrozoology. Now, at Carroll College, we have this brand new major, and we focus primarily on human-animal dogs, human-horse relationships, and the human-animal bond. According to the American Veterinary Medical Association, the human-animal bond is defined as a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals that is influenced by their behaviors and enhance the welfare of both. That's the American Veterinary Medical Association for you. But here you can see that this dog is participating in this human-animal bond. Applied anthrozoology is taking our understanding of the human-animal bond and putting it to practical use. So, for example, we can train dogs for the military, dogs for police work. We can train dogs to support people with all kinds of disabilities. Dogs have a keen sense of smell and can detect things that we cannot. In addition, animals are really, really healthy for people. So one of the most important foundational studies in anthrozoology was conducted by Dr. Erica Friedman. She and her colleagues were interested in the recovery rates of patients that were, had had cardiac surgery. So what factors might contribute to their survival? The unexpected outcome was that patients who went home to a pet had a significantly higher probability of being alive one year later than patients that went home to no pets. So what is it about the pets that's enhancing their human health and giving them a higher probability of survival. Multiple studies have now been conducted that clearly give empirical data showing that being with pets lowers blood pressure, lowers heart rate, and lowers stress, your feelings of stress. So we could all use a pet. Um, another often cited study that's really amazing was conducted by Odendahl and Miedis. They looked at blood samples taken from 17 dog owners and their dogs 30 minutes before and following positive interaction. So you just kind of interact with your dog 
They analyzed the blood samples of both their dogs and the owners, and all of these feel-good neurochemicals and hormones were significantly increased following 30 minutes of positive interaction. So endorphins, oxytocin, prolactin, dopamine, beta-phenylethylalanine, Beta-phenylethylalanine is that active ingredient in chocolate that we learned about earlier. So you just have to pet your dog and there you go. If you're walking your dog out there in Bozeman, and I see a lot of these well-mannered dogs, people will come up to you and say, may I pet your dog? They know, people know when they're asking that, they're gonna get a rush of these, of these hormones. That's why today, there are nonprofit organizations that certify dogs to visit schools, prisons, nursing homes, hospitals. It, it is human health enhancing. Now, horses also en enhance human health, both physical and mental. So if you're working with a physical therapist, we have demonstrated empirical evidence that it can increase core muscle strength, increase body tone, certainly help with balance. And there's data that shows that clients will work harder at their therapy if a horse is involved in the process. Now, equine facilitated psychotherapy or counseling is a burgeoning industry. We're not really sure how it works, but a licensed counselor partnering with a horse professional have been treating things like addiction, trauma, anxiety, uh, family counseling, depression, and we are not really sure the role of the horse, how it works. We don't have the foundational theories, but here is the one I like. Horses are a prey species and humans are predators. We have a long, long history with horses, and we have co-evolved with them. So horses have developed an uncanny ability to perceive human intentions and know what they're feeling. Yeah. All right, every, every cowboy and every riding instructor, and I myself has, have experienced this, have known that if you have a bad attitude or you're having a bad day, leave it at home, don't bring it to the barn. If you are not mindful and fully present with the horse that you're working with, your session won't go so well. <laughs> All right. you, have to be, you have to be there with that animal. So um, that sounds mystical. Yeah, how, how can we prove it? An ingenious team of scientists in Sweden developed an experiment to help demonstrate this point. So what they did is they had 20 human volunteers and 10 horses, and they were all outfitted with heart rate monitors. They asked the volunteers to walk four times out, 30 meters and back. And they were measuring the heart rate of both the horses and the humans. On the fourth trip, the experimenter told the human handler, I have an assistant up there that's going to open an umbrella as you walk by. And of course, they expected that the horse would be frightened. So they're, they're walking out. In fact, the umbrella never opened. It never opened. The fourth trip was identical in every way to the third trip. And as expected, the heart rates of the human handlers was significantly higher on the fourth trip because they anticipated that umbrella. But the remarkable outcome was that the heart rate of the horses was also statistically significantly higher on the fourth trip. So clearly, the horses were picking up on something that the human handlers were projecting in their emotions and thoughts. This is Chris. He's a former anthrozoology student and a veteran who suffered from PTSD. He was incredibly talented with dogs, but horses did not get along with him. In fact, they would run away from him when he was working with horses in our program. He asked me, Dr. Perkins, what can I do to have a better relationship with horses? And I told Chris, Chris, horses are not comfortable when you're anxious. You have to be calm. That's a hard thing to say to someone with PTS. But he went into the arena and there were horses at Liberty walking all around and he went in, he closed his eyes and he said, I'm gonna be calm. And when he opened his eyes, Socrates, our little black Icelandic horse, had his head breathing on Chris's chest. 
And that was a profound experience for Chris. Socrates the horse was providing biofeedback information to Chris that he had achieved a calm state. Probably more powerful than the counselor saying that. And so psychologists call that affect regulation. Here you have a slide of two of our Carroll College graduates, uh, Ruger the Black Lab and McKinsey are now both employed by Working Dogs for Conservation. In fact, Megan Parker, who was a co-founder for Working Dogs for Conservation, he, located here in Bozeman, has been a former TED speaker. Ruger has now been trained to detect ivory, contraband, and munition. And McKinsey is an experienced trainer now supporting the African Scout and Ruger in their important assignments of, of um, detecting contraband. They have been to Zambia, Africa, and Ruger has made some really significant ivory busts. So we're very proud of them. <laughs> Go ahead. If you raised your hand because you sleep with your pet or bought a Christmas present, if you kiss them on the lips, then you care deeply about anthrozoology. And I am so very proud that we are now offering that as a scholarly and academic degree, and we were first in the nation to do that. I, I want you to check into your own anthrozoological feelings as you watch this final demonstration. Did you go? Thank you so much. Here we go.